Welcome again to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, the program in which we take an intergenerational approach to the book of Revelation. I'm John Pauline. I'm professor of religion at Loma Linda University, and I'm absolutely delighted to have a new panelist with us who's kind of my age for a change. So why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pauline. Yes, my name is Radim Milosavljevic. I'm a retired pastor, but still uh, working. One of the associate pastors at Loma Linda University Church and also working part-time for ADRA. But still, I like Revelation. And 30 years ago, we used to play full court basketball with and against each other. Yeah. Good times. So we beat each other a little bit. I think, <laughs> I don't remember those. I don't remember the times you won. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing with our panelists. <laughs> yes, uh, Luis Gustavo Cis, uh, pastor in Orange County, Brazilian, uh, and delighted to be here again. I'm Guilherme Borda. I'm also a pastor and a PhD uh, student in New Testament at Andrews University. All right, so we have been studying Revelation chapter 17, and as I think we mentioned last time, one of the toughest texts in the entire Bible. And so uh, my new friend here, an old friend, Rade, is going to read the first three verses of the chapter to bring us up uh, to where we were at the end last time. Okay, uh, that's Revelation chapter 17 from uh, verse 1. And one of uh, the seven angels, who had seven bowels, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants on the earth were intoxicated with the wine of the adulterers. Then the angels carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with a um, blasphemous name and had seven heads and ten horns. So last time, as we were looking at this text, uh, uh, we noticed a number of things. First of all, the woman here in many ways reminds of the, uh, the woman in chapter 12 who we leave in the desert, and then suddenly the next time you see a woman, uh, she's in the desert still, but now she looks different than the one in chapter 12. So we notice the parallel there. So this, this one in the, sorry, the 12th mm -hmm. chapter is a pure woman. Yeah, yeah. Faithful that's one. How, that's how, but you here, you know, suddenly same setting, uh, and, and she looks uh, different. We also noticed that the, you have John hears a prostitute sitting on waters. Then in verse 3, he sees a woman sitting on a beast. Mm -hmm. So we, elsewhere in the book of Revelation, when John hears one thing and sees something very different, they're the same thing. You know, for example, in chapter 5, he hears the lion of the tribe of Judah. When he looks, he sees a lamb, as it were, slain. Mm -hmm. Totally different image, mm -hmm. same thing. So as you look at this, this simplifies the chapter a little bit because in chapter 17 you have a woman relating to waters, which we saw was the Euphrates River. Mm -hmm. uh, so the woman Babylon, Euphrates River, the river of Babylon. In chapter 17 too, you have the harlot interacting with the kings of the earth. And in 17 you see a woman sitting on the beast. And so we came to realize the waters, the kings, the beast is all the same thing. The prostitute, prostitute, woman, all the same thing. So the, these images for Babylon are of a worldwide religious alliance at the end of time. And these other images, water, Euphrates River, kings, beast, these are images for worldwide political secular power in this world at the end of time. So at the end of time, those who oppose God will be divided into two camps. One of them religious, one of them more secular, political, etc. So uh, as we are looking at these things, there's a lot of details yeah. in this chapter. <laughs> 
and you can get lost in the details. But basically, there's two worldwide alliances against God and his people at the end. We're not there today. There's probably never been a time in history where that was totally true. Uh, but uh, the idea that there'd be a worldwide United Nations, you know, kind of a little bit hard to, to figure right now, but in, in times of strife and trouble, uh, people sometimes pull together that otherwise wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you have uh, worldwide religious power that has some authority over the political powers. The woman riding the beast, mm -hmm. you know, the, the rider is in charge. So that's the basic outline of what we covered at the end last time. And yes, we, Rodney. We had uh, during mm -hmm. Dr. Pauline, during the Middle Ages, as, as we know through the history, that a religion uh, dominated um, above the political authority right. and, and power. Right, right, yes. So, so looks like this is the prophecy that rebirth <laughs> that that is going to happen in the last uh, the end of time mm -hmm. and we don't know when yeah yeah and you even have the rebirth imagery in chapter 13 we noticed because one of the heads is wounded to death yes and then it's resurrected in verse 14 it says came to life killed. as resurrection language killed and came to life mm -hmm. so there you have i think the point you're making that is sort of reestablishing the kind of, uh, and everybody was that way that then. I mean, Babylon was essentially a religious power. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar, the minute Daniel is captives came, you gotta learn new religion. You gotta, you know, this, this, and this, you gotta bow down to my statue. So religion dominating the political sphere has been true throughout history, I think. Yeah. So this is not, not the, the, uh, the power, as you mentioned, the mm -hmm. Babylon, uh, of the first beast or the second beast. Mm -hmm. This is the worldwide... This is the end time worldwide picture here in chapter 17. You do have the end time worldwide picture at the end of chapter 13, where you have the image of the beast. And uh, Rebecca Liu, who is uh, one of the finest doctoral students that I have ever um, had a chance to, to mentor, uh, she studied the image of the beast and concluded to my surprise, I thought she was wrong. She concluded mm. that the image of the beast is Babylon. I always thought the image of the beast is the beast in chapter 17. Mm. That's the, you know, here you have image of the beast. Well, there's, this looks just like the beast of chapter 13. So that's always the way I had looked at it. But she convinced me that no, the image of the beast is actually Babylon in chapter 17, and that kind of made some things come together, I think, uh, in my mind, so. Wow. Anyway. That's, that's amazing. So, gentlemen, your thoughts. You know, uh, an interesting thing that I noticed also considering this text uh, when we talk about that beast is that it has the seven heads and the ten horns. And that also reminds us of the description we find of the dragon in chapter 12. Mm-hmm. When we went through chapter 12, we saw that, um, I, I, hope, I, I, I hope we did include that in our discussion in, mm -hmm. I don't know how many episodes ago this was, yeah. <laughs> several dozen episodes ago. But in chapter 12, you see a description of the dragon that matches the persecuting power of Rome at the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But then the dragon is identified in chapter 12 as the devil, as Satan, as the ancient serpent. So it seems to be the case in chapter 12 that that dragon is in a way both Rome, both the Roman power and Satan. Here, as we see political power, you know, of multiple ethnicities, global power represented in this beast in chapter 17, we also see that it resembles the dragon. It resembles Satan. Mm -hmm. So I think this also ties into the theme that behind uh, political powers in the conflict between good and evil, Satan is working through these political powers. And so to me, I see this beast as being both political power, political system or systems together, and Satan working together or Satan mm -hmm. working through them. At least. Are you talking about, a, when you're mentioning a beast, are you talking about a Babylon? No, this beast that, that the woman is sitting on, right? That when you go to yeah, chapter how 17. Can, how can Babylon sit on Babylon? 
<laughs> yeah, somehow could could looks like, but but yeah. it's uh, it's not. Yeah. No, no. What I'm saying is that this this beast in chapter 17 that uh, Dr. Pauline has just talked about as political powers of the world supporting this religious political alliance called Babylon, uh, that is apostate religion and uh, uh, Satan influenced religion. Also, you have satanic influence in the political power as well, right. as, as mm -hmm. the dragon is working also with through this beast to support that, his uh, political, okay. his religious political alliance in Babylon. And Gustavo knows in Daniel 10, mm -hmm. you, know, you have the prince of Persia and the kings of Persia, mm -hmm. which is a puzzling text until you realize that the prince of Persia is behind and above. Mm -hmm. the kings of Persia. Yes, working behind them. Which is, uh, all this conversation reminded me of um, the description of the dragon in chapter 12, uh, which is very similar to the language of the first beast in chapter 13. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they look alike, and here we don't have the dragon, but is invoking that language, mm -hmm. and it is looking as one of the instruments of the dragon in chapter 13, who went after the woman, and apparently captured the woman and, and turned her into someone else. And so both are working together. So this idea of the political, let's say, reality, and behind that political reality, we have a supernatural reality yeah. or a mm -hmm. spiritual reality, um, uh, both working with the same purpose, with the same design. And, and I think that's very helpful, understanding what's going on in today's world, because you have conflicts in today's world, some, some terrible conflicts, uh, going on, and the question is, who are the good guys? And the biblical answer is there are no good guys when it comes to politics and religion. Mm -hmm. That ultimately, uh, both of these are, are a mixture of God's action and uh, the devil's action. Mm -hmm. So uh, every political entity, uh, even every religious entity, is to some degree conflicted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to simply totally give ourselves our allegiance to some earthly entity uh, is not wise in the light of these uh, mm -hmm. larger realities. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what is this blasphemy all about? Did you notice in, in verse 3? Yeah. What is blasphemy? Anybody want to define that for us? This beast is full of names of blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Help our viewers understand. Well, just beginning with the word itself, right? Mm -hmm. The word blasphemy comes uh, from the Greek word blasphemia. It's interesting in Portuguese, we say blasphemia, mm -hmm. which is almost a transliteration of the Greek yeah. blasphemia, right? Which could be translated, if you check BDAG, this lexicon that New Testament scholars use a lot, uh, then you will, you will see that this word uh, blasphemy, in general, it could have uh, the sense of speaking uh, reviling or uh, speaking uh, in disrespectful way about a divinity, but it could be also reviling, uh, speaking about people slandering them, right? So blasphemy uh, in, the, in the ancient uh, world, in the time of the New Testament, it could be against humans, it could be against God. Mm -hmm. So you see, for example, in chapter 2, uh, the, the blasphemy that, uh, that Jesus refers to might be suggesting that there are these Jews there in the city of Smyrna that are slandering the Christians and even complicating their already yeah. socially delicate uh, circumstances, right? Yeah. So the, the word can have these, these meanings. We often just say blasphemy. We may think only about the religious dimension of this word, but blasphemy can also be a form of... Uh, we can, mm -hmm. I guess, to use the language of the Ten Commandments, you can think of it also as... Uh, bearing false witness, you know. Well, we think of blasphemy kind of like swearing or something like that. Yeah. But really, it's slander. Yeah, you know, I mean, it can include that too. You're saying something about God yeah. that isn't true. Yeah. It can include yeah. this, speaking uh, disrespectfully about a deity, and that's yeah. including the lexicon too, but it could be slandering. Yeah, uh, it, it reminds me also the, the, the discussion in, in Mark chapter 2, where you have Jesus mm -hmm. forgiven the sins of a person, and he is... Um, um, the, the individuals who are against Jesus, they call that act blasphemy. So he, Jesus was doing something that only God was expected to do in, mm -hmm. in their world in the world view. Yeah. So blasphemy in that sense is not only, let's say, speaking words against the divinity, 
uh, against God, but also, let's say, perform acts that are only performed by God. So taking that upon yourself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, which one is here in chapter 17? I don't think it is either or. I think it can be both. Uh, this, this, as we already discussed, this <clears throat> woman uh, is a religious figure. And mm -hmm. she's performing, she, she's, be, she's dressed as a uh, religious figure and uh, could be taking upon herself God's, let's say, deeds, God's actions and attributed that to herself. Mm -hmm. Pop quiz ready. Also, Are you ready? Yeah. Also <laughs> could be, um, as Revelation 12, 1 and, mm -hmm. and 19 and 21 at Revelation, talking about a faithful, uh, pure uh, church, mm -hmm. did blasphemy refer to her? Mm. So goes, uh, uh, goes against her with, with all of these uh, blasphemies. So the question that I always were, were wrestling is, um, is this woman uh, sitting on the beast? Is that a Babylon? as we were uh, talking about, worldwide uh, political mm -hmm. alliance and, and all of that. Well, in verse 5, um, <laughs> she's wearing a crown. Yes. And in front of the crown says, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, which means, um, which means uh, that woman in, um, sooner or later in the future, at the end time, are going to take a power hmm. sitting as a religion sitting over the 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 worldwide political power mm -hmm. is that good for that us is, as a seven day adventist and in this context yeah, that is the prophetic surprise our program gps god's prophetic surprises you look for the surprises when it comes to prophecy and the big surprise is that the greatest opponent of God at the end of time has a Christian face. Because as we saw last time, verses four and five, she's dressed like the high priest. Uh, she's in the desert like the woman of chapter 12. So John, when he sees this woman, it's kind of like, I don't believe what I'm seeing, you know? Uh, such a change. So uh, we see that the, the religious power at the end time, even with a Christian face, will have dominance over the world, not where we are today. But that's the picture that prophecy is warning us about as we move to the end. But I wanted to give you a pop quiz here just for fun. How yeah. many women are there in the book of Revelation? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, basically two. One, one uh, as I mentioned, uh -huh. Revelation 12, uh, 19 and 22, yeah. it's a pure and faithful one. Yeah. And the other one is it's unfaithful, uh -huh. basically. Yeah. But probably there, there are more. Well. As you get toward the end of the book, there's another woman mm -hmm. called the Bride of Christ. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yes, I mean, yeah you, know exactly. the, you know this, but I just, yeah. as yeah, we think it through. There's a fourth one, too. It's, huh? And there's there's a fourth one. There's a fourth one, too. Yeah, go ahead. Jezebel. Jezebel, in yeah. chapter two. You see? So two of the women in Revelation are positive. The woman of 12 and the New Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the Bride of Christ. Uh, Jezebel and Babylon are linked up uh, here uh, through chapter 2 and chapter 17, yeah. Maybe I'm opening, I'm digressing that much, but given that reference to Jezebel in chapter 2, uh, in the block of the seven churches, when you, I don't know when, you all covered the seven churches of Revelation in this program? Years ago. Years ago, yeah. yes. <laughs> But several years ago, based on the, the rhythm that we are following here. Younger, yeah. But uh, is it, uh, do you see echoes of this, let's say, end part of Revelation in the seven churches, which is the first part of the book? Do you mm. see echoes, let's say, connecting Jezebel with... Yeah who is perverting the minds of the Christians of that particular congregation. I forgot which congregation yeah. was. But. You mean Jezebel in the time of Elijah? No, no, the, the oh. Jezebel that is being referred by in Revelation, is yeah. that related? Yeah. You know, that's a big question among scholars of Revelation. Uh, in a real sense, you go to the seven churches, and it seems to be talking about the church, mm -hmm. you know, local churches, yeah. etc. And mm -hmm. it's relatively unsymbolic. Mm -hmm. But then you get after chapter four and beyond, you seem to be talking about the wider world and you have Babylon and Egypt yeah. and Sodom and uh, mm -hmm. all this other stuff. 
does that have anything to do with the seven churches? In other words, is the primary issue in the book of Revelation inside the house of the church? Mm -hmm. Or is it outside? So many scholars see Babylon, et cetera, as ancient Rome, you know, reading Revelation from its original context. But the churches are not about Rome. Mm -mm. They're not about pagan Rome. The churches are about battles within the church. Uh, yeah. I would understand that the latter part of Revelation is addressing on a bigger scale the same issues as the seven churches. Mm -hmm. So Jezebel might be a local leader in a local church mm -hmm in first century Asia Minor, mm -hmm. but she's in a way a type of a much larger figure that comes along later Can I on. just read a little bit from that portion? So yeah. in chapter two, mm -hmm. verse 20, Jesus says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So think about this, she's a false prophet, Mm -hmm. You have the false prophet in chapter 16. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, uh, out of its mouth comes one of the unclean spirits of, uh, there in the context of the sixth of the sixth plague, sixth bowl. And then she teaches and sed uh, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And then you have in chapter 17 this woman mm -hmm. that uh, she has. Uh, you know, a golden cup full of abomination and the filthiness of her, uh, of her fornication. And then there's the, the, uh, the mention of her sexual immorality too. I'm, I'm missing the, the actual verse here. Maybe but, verse uh, three? Oh, no, no. Well, verse, verse two, she yeah. commits uh, adultery. Yes, uh, with whom with the, the kings. kings of the earth committed fornication yeah. and the heads of the earth were made drunk yeah. with the wine of her fornication. Yeah. Uh, I would say... Uh, when you read chapter 2, my servants remind me immediately the reference to prophets as God's servants in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So she is, let's say, twisting the words of the prophets or people who were expected to deliver God's message. Here, it seems like it is in a broader scale in the idea mm -hmm. that it is what you saw in the local church in that small scenario. It is going to happen worldwide with political figures, political leaders, and uh, I mean, I don't want you to be harsh against women in the Bible, not far from me from, from doing it. But if you go to uh, Jezebel, the real Jezebel, in, in 1 Kings chapter uh, 16, she's, uh, uh, it is, she came to Israel, she went to Israel as part of a political alliance between Omri, king of Israel, with Phoenicia, with uh, Sidon. And she's the one responsible for bringing, I mean, not bringing, but let's say, Put it on steroids, the cult of Baal in ancient mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. So all that conversation about Elijah and the prophet Sobeo uh, in Mount Carmel, that simply happened because that woman brought those false prophets with twisted message into the land of Israel. And so maybe, mm -hmm. again, tiny little scenario in mm -hmm. the 19th cent uh, ninth century Israel, BC, 9th century BC in Israel, 1st century A.D. in Asia Minor, Jezebel twisting the, the words of my servants, end time, worldwide, mm -hmm. same woman or a, 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 a female figure with the same type of characteristics of this other shift. And prophecy often begins with the time and place of the prophet. Yeah. And the prophet sees in the immediate future mm -hmm. things that recall what will happen at the end of time. And so the immediate situation becomes a type of a much larger situation. I have a question because yeah. you asked about the blasphemous names. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think we haven't addressed is that in chapter 17, verse 3, mm -hmm. it's the beast that was, uh, the question is, is it the beast or is it the woman that is full of names of blasphemy? It's the beast, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. And if it's the beast, yeah. mm -hmm. then what does it mean with relationship to the beast as uh, if we see it as the same as the waters, many peoples, you know, nations, I think it is all of that, yeah. mm -hmm. then what does it mean? I wonder, could it be that, not, not claiming to be like a comprehensive mm -hmm. picture, but could it be that this also has something to do with the fact that these people bear the mark of the beast and bearing the mark of the beast, all of these people bearing the mark of the beast, they are full of names of blasphemy because they have the name of the beast on them. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's at least part of the picture here. Yeah. 
But one thing I would note is, is the beast of chapter 13, the beast from the sea, is kind of a blend of religious and political power. Mm -hmm. When you re look, look at the images yeah. there, in 17, those two are separated more. You know, the woman is clearly the religious figure, the beast is clearly a political figure, but it bleeds over. Uh, the two are in alliance here. So, so that, that, that mm -hmm. would be somehow, sorry that I snap yeah. you. My, my question uh, uh, seems to me in this context that two of these beasts from Revelation 13, mm. and here we have in chapter 17, and the, the Babylon is another, another uh, beast, let's put that away, uh, w working together. Mm -hmm. uh, how come and why that's so important? Actually, uh, John got that, that vision, that woman uh, uh, sitting, uh, dominating, uh, dominating the beast. Why, why is that so important when they are connected, working together somehow mm -hmm. for this end time? Yeah, in, in ancient times, religion and uh, political power always mingled together. But that kind of separated. The, the distinction between religious and secular has become greater and greater uh, as we come into our time. And this sees the union of the religious and the political as being a surprise. You know, might as well read verse six because I was uh, thinking to go there next. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. This is a third entity. So you have three alliances. You have on the one hand, uh, this Babylon, on the other hand, you have this beast. They're worldwide alliances in opposition to God. But now you have the saints, which is a third alliance worldwide of those who are uh, faithful, faithful to God. To God yes. But clearly in opposition to Babylon uh, and vice versa. Well, it's interesting. We have uh, dug through a number of things and we're ready to continue going through chapter 17 when we get together again uh, next time. But until then, I'm John Pauline, and this has been GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises. Hope to see you next time.